You're listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick. Okay, uh, we're lucky enough today to be up in Townsville, lovely warm Townsville up in North Queensland, and a very dear f- friend and a long associate. We, we, we've known each other for now 20 years and de- dealt with each other uh, along the way with great success for inventors, Terry Herlock. And uh, Terry has yeah, 50 years of experience in this industry. There's not many people who'd know more about the process of invention and development of products and IP than Terry does. He's a, a wealth of experience. He's sort of coming to the end of his career, but uh, you know, on the way out, we're just gonna get him on, on file. Terry was telling me a story. Uh, I'm also sorry with Ian. Ian uh, is a new new player in the game. He's been with Terry for three weeks now. But Ian, uh, Terry is, is teaching Ian all he knows, so there'll be a legacy when Terry uh, decides he wants to go and fish. Uh, Ian will be here to take his spot and hopefully uh, Terry's knowledge, he'll have a, a wealth of knowledge himself to help uh, inventors to carry on with their, with their tasks. But I was speaking to Terry last night and uh, I, I didn't actually know this, but he said that when, the reason he got into intellectual property protection was as a young lad at, uh, in the 60s, he was involved with the Xerox copying machines, which were very, very innovative in their time. And the guy who actually came up with the paintable aspect of that was cut out of, this, cut out of the scheme of things. And, and Terry saw that and saw that's just not, not right. And he's spent his life basically trying to make sure that if people have good intellectual property and good inventions and good patentable products, he's going to make sure that they are covered. So um, if you'd just like to say hello, Terry, and uh, introduce yourself and sort of give us a few reasons, you know, why you got into the industry and, you know, and what you've achieved over the years, that'd be fantastic. Okay, well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is a new area for me because uh, I'm getting long in the tooth and um, I'm afraid I'm not really up with all of this new methods of communication and I'm told this is going to go on to a podcast and uh, then on to social media and I'm afraid that's where my knowledge sort of stops and but I'm quite happy to impart any knowledge I can from 50 years of experience in handling or holding the hand of inventors through their process of turning their ideas into reality. I'm happy to do so and uh, and hope somebody listens to it and uh, learns from it. Well, we do find that we are sort of, uh, this area is a little bit hard to find information on. So what we're trying to do is just, I just give, give guidance to people who are in this field. And uh, as you can imagine, Ian, you've been in this industry for three weeks. Yes. How much is there to learn? I mean, there's just so much knowledge to absorb about all different aspects to be successful. Uh, Terry and I are both, we're in a group of people, um, Invention Pathways. I, mean, I consult to Invention Pathways, or I, I, I take the clients that come from Invention Pathways and help them to do the product development part of things. Terry helps them with the commercialization and the um, uh, 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 entry strategies and patenting uh, and IP protection. Um, but both of us, or the group here, is very focused on outcomes. We, we're not really interested in individually just making design awards or getting you know, money in the bank for IP. We really are interested in the product coming out the other end of this sausage machine and and making a commercial success. So, I mean, when when you look around, the the stuff you're gonna have to learn in the next few years from Terry before he retires is going to be, well, very useful for you, but also very, very valuable and and, and there's a lot to learn, but. There is, there is, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you've been in other industries. Uh, it's, It's a fairly fast paced and fairly thought-provoking industry there's a, there's a lot to consider with every decision you make and uh, every bit of advice you give out every project is different every every scenario is different you just have to sort of like let it settle in your brain and then come up with a logical direction for the client yeah you do you do and that's one of the, the um, parts that really attracted me to the role is that it is so interesting yeah. um, and there is so much to learn so yeah it's, it's been a wonderful experience so far. There's a lot going on in the space at the moment I think it's going to improve as people realise how necessary invention is for Australian manufacturing and, mm. and its, its future, future role in, in the world's economy. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more. So I've got a few questions here. I won't babble on too much because obviously these things start to run on a bit. But I'd like to ask you, with all your years, they're going to be pretty broad questions, but yeah. but this is the sort of thing that's going to, there's no one better to ask these questions to. They're very broad. Um, but away. the number one reason for a, a failed project. Mm. 
over the years, all your experience, what okay. have you seen to be the one thing that people fail on? Okay, usually starting from the beginning, we will get an inquiry that comes in in much the same fashion, doesn't matter how they come to us, whether it's over the phone, email, or through the website or whatever. Usually they have one you know, simple question is, and they say, I've got a good idea, and what do I do with it? That's how they usually the ideas come to me. If the ideas are good, and we usually at that stage will ask a client to explain what their idea is and so forth, and we go through a process of establishing confidentiality between us and the client, they tell us about their idea, and then we're in a position to assess whether or not it's going to be something that can be patentable, uh, whether or not it will work in the marketplace, and whether it's worthwhile doing something about it. So that's usually how the process starts. Good ideas come in, silly ideas come in, bad ideas come in. But usually most people want to know if it's been done before, if it's been previously patented, are they wasting their time, and so on. That sort of questions all happen inside a, the first stage where we assess what the invention is and we assess whether or not it is patentable and also what its likely effect on the marketplace is going to be. For instance, most people have got a new idea that solves problems. So we will assess whether or not that problem has got other ways of solving that problem. And if not, well, then they might have hit the jackpot with something suitable. We're still waiting, for instance, for somebody to come in with something that you can put onto a bald head and grow hair. <laughs> and at that time, and at that time, I think I'll write a check for a million dollars for them to help them along their way. We haven't yet got that one, but it's always there. But we have had over the period of a many, many years, seen many really good inventions. And some have got, had success in the marketplace, some have not. Um, in fact, probably the majority have not. And if they fail, usually it's human reasons why they fail, not on the invention. It's usually they fail because the client runs out of money, um, he gets divorced, he dies, all sorts of reasons why it doesn't sort of complete and get into the marketplace. So we've seen many, many inventions that are really good inventions, but they're never getting to see the light of day. Yeah, excellent. No, it's true. I've, I've um, got my little list too, and uh, one is ego. You know, if you start designing a product for yourself, rather than what the market needs are, that's true. that can kill a project, it can, it can become unsuitable for the market, that, that's one big one. Money management is a big yeah. one, cash flow is, is a massive one. People come to me after having bad advice, that's why our oh, that's, Invention Pathways that's for us. connection is very, very important because the advice we give is from experience. We've all had experience in the industry, we've all you know, got good advice to give. And shortcuts. People take shortcuts yeah. and they build their project on sand. Yeah. Uh, they may not get the right patent, patent advice or they might not take the patent advice they're given and they end up causing themselves problems down the track which shortens the life of the project and maybe, maybe kills it. Uh, the, the second question for me is obvious, obvious uh, number one reason for successful projects. Successful projects, you can pretty well lump them into two primary areas. Uh, the first one is where a tradesman has seen a problem, solved that problem with a new invention. Or a tradeswoman. Or a tradeswoman, sorry, <laughs> yes, uh, sorry to do that, yeah. Uh, Terry's tradesman and tradeswoman, <laughs> yeah. They've solved a problem because they're in that business. Yes. And it's a problem that uh, they have solved for their trade. And there's a couple of reasons why that particular one succeeds is because A, they know the business, a, they've not found in their, within their profession an answer to that problem, so they got out and decided to invent something that suits it and solves the problem. And they know the industry well enough to know what its opportunities are likely to be in the marketplace. Yeah. So if you're a tradesman out there and you've got an idea that answers problems in your own trade, you can pretty well bet your life that it's going to be a very, very good chance of success. I agree. The next one, and number two in that field of successful stories, is a person who's got, who's invented something, but it's, he's not in the trade that he's 
you know, invented something and it might be just a good idea. Um, for instance, uh, a housewife coming up with an idea about credit cards or something like that where she's not in the credit card business but she knows what she wants from a point of view of a user of credit cards. If she's got the money and the determination, then she might be able to get that particular invention under the nose of the people who do produce credit cards and so forth. And that then would be a success. But what she requires in that situation is not so much a knowledge of the business, but help to know where to go and how to do it to get in front of the key players in a particular industry. And of course, it takes sometimes a lot of money. Yeah. And there is a third group. And the third group are, as you pointed out, people who've made a machine on a farm. They got their wielder out and solved a problem for themselves. And that was a common practice up here in the north in Townsville. In fact, that's how I started. There were no patent attorneys in the 50s when I started up here. And so they'd come to me because I was in the area of marketing and doing tourism marketing, actually. And they came to me and said, you know, where do I go? What do I do with this? I've got this new idea. I think it might be worth a bit of money, but, you know, I need somebody to help me. And so I realised then that there was a niche market for holding the hand of inventors through the problems that they have with getting patents, through the problems of commercialisation, and hopefully manufactured and into the marketplace. And as such, we then engaged people like Scott here, who are expert at uh, uh, making prototype uh, from people's ideas out of their head. And so Scott and I go back a long time and I think he would have done some probably hundreds now of inventions that we've sent to him uh, for prototype purposes. Because the first thing that uh, an inventor has to have is enough dedication, money and determination to take his idea from his head onto paper, from the paper into reality so that he's got something that can be shown to somebody else and you reach what's called a proof of concept stage. It's actually got to work. Agreed. So you mentioned a key word in there, um, persistence. Yeah. First of all, she said, persistence I think is one of the, the key attributes to a successful project or a successful inventor. Uh, I think that planning is very, very important, and that's why coming to see someone like Terry, uh, with all the plans written out, you know, he's seen hundreds and hundreds of projects go through. Yeah. He has a plan for almost every one. There might be one that might trick him up a bit, which you'll, which you'll, you'll actually look at and then make a new plan for. Yeah. And, and I think building things on a solid foundation, I always say, you know, do it right or don't do it, and, and it's all there is to it, really. If you, if you don't build it on rock, you know, it's very easily washed away and you spend as much money building stuff on sand as you do building on rocks. So oh, do, do, get the I, right advice. Yeah, I couldn't do agree it with right. you more. Yeah. One of the things that highlights that particular thing is that a lot of people come to us and they ask for government assistance with the money side of matters to get their prototypes made and so forth and to get to a stage where they've got something to show. And there's a fair amount of government assistance available under various headings. It does change every time a government changes, they change the rules and regulations surrounding that money. But it's usually money to try and assist inventors get their product commercialised and into the marketplace. But in doing so, government bodies tend to ask an inventor for things like business plans and things like that. Well, sometimes when it's just an idea in your head, it's very difficult to produce a business plan for something that's just in your head. So usually they might fail in that regard of getting government assistance. So we move ourselves in our company now to a, a direction where we don't produce business plans for people until they've got a business. But what we do produce is what we call a market entry strategy. That means to say a new product entering the market has to have some form of strategic plan to get into the marketplace and where does it go? because when you've got a new product that is new and a new invention and nobody's seen it before, then you've got a problem because most companies will step back from anything that's completely new and they've never seen before. So the difficulty of getting it into the marketplace is something that we see all the time. And a help to that is where um, an inventor will go to the expense of getting a market entry strategy done, which involves research, marketing, and finding out who's who in the zoo in his industry, in the industry that the invention's going to enter, and to make sure that 
he's got at least half a chance of success with the idea. Yes, uh, it's a very, very valuable document early stage because that ties into the planning we talked about earlier yep. and that's part of the success of a good project is to have a plan and follow mm. it. Deviating from that plan, we had a seminar today and I, I brought two subjects to the, or two projects to the floor as, a, as examples of projects that didn't follow the plan, came very close to falling on their sword. Um, so yeah, planning is very important. Um, I said before, we, we're, we're both interested in, um, or, you know, it's more than just two of us, that the Invention Pathways uh, company is quite large now. It's, it's got a very nice uh, new, new associate. Yeah, our, <laughs> um, yeah, in our group now, under the Trusted Advisor Group, we've probably got about six or seven people. But in terms of associates that spread out from the company, there's probably close on 30 to 40 people that we know for various expertise, you being one of them for engineering design and things like that. Uh, there's people who specialise in packaging. We have legal people who specialise in legal agreements and so forth for patenting and for infringement matters and so forth. We have the our patent, patent attorneys themselves who do all the drafting of the patent specifications for patent work. And we've got accountants and bookkeepers and so on. And we can advise on startups of businesses and things like that. So we've got many strands of assistance to an inventor that I think is fairly unique in Australia. I don't think there's anybody else that does the complete service uh, to inventors. And um, unfortunately, I'm getting of an age now where I'm going to have to pass over these skills to somebody <laughs> like Ian, because it's taken 30 or 40 years to, to for people to realise that taking an invention into the marketplace is not easy. It's a difficult process and it requires skill, careful management and spend sometimes a lot of money to make sure that that particular invention gets into the marketplace and has a a chance to succeed. Yeah, excellent. Now also talking about the Trusted Advisory, advisory Service, that's another association you've just formed. Um, mm. In fact, the owner of the Trusted, uh, Trusted Advisory Service, sorry, yeah, I got a mental, right. mental blade then, um, has actually bought into an Invention Pathways and yes, uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is now the owner. Yeah. So um, so it's, it's great because that brings a, another, another aspect to it, which uh, Angelo is not here at the moment, but uh, he has, uh, filled one of the gaps that probably existed in a, in a way with the funding options. So he's working very hard in the last few days have been learning about what they can do as far as funding. And that's yep. very exciting from an inventor's perspective because they can get to a certain point and usually they need assistance after that and uh, Angelo's working hard to fill that gap. So that's great. As I said, we might try and get an interview with him later. He's not here at the moment, but uh, it'd be good to speak to him as well. Uh, as I said before, we're very, we're very out, out, um, you know, outcome driven. We we're not really interested in design awards and that sort of business. We really want to see commercial successes from the from the projects. And Terry's been really good with me in the in the in the in the twenty years and working with patent strategies that work for startups and inventors. And you know, we we work very well with provisionals and staged patent strategies to make sure that the cash flow works well on a commercial project when there's not endless bounds of money and resources and even time you know a lot of people are working still while they're trying to get this done we try and hold their hand and do the work mm -hmm. um, so they can still keep working and and, uh, and keep yeah. progressing the project we've all, I've also seen Terry use the innovation patent it's, it's not a very useful patent in most situations no, but Terry's yes, used it, it to, to, to very good use and yeah. in some scenarios where say perhaps uh, a, a recent scenario where the client was actually going to show his product so he had to have some cover but he didn't have a fully resolved idea, but he had, usually an innovation patent, just to, just to clarify that, is usually two, two technology that already exists combined into one that's unique. Yes. And um, Terry utilized that innovation patent in a way I, I, I learned was possible, which I hadn't known before, where um, he used it as a start point and then progressed it into a standard patent or a PCT, yes. which was something um, quite innovative in, in, in a process. And I thought that was a really, really uh, useful way of utilising that patent. Yeah, we've, and we've, used the, um, we've used the innovation patent quite successfully over the years in certain situations. And it's usually designed and best used for somebody who's already got their invention ready and working. You know, somebody who's invented something in their farm shed, for instance, and it actually works and it's, it's ready to go to market, if you like. 
and they might have produced a few of these or got it made somewhere else and suddenly stocked up with a product that they want to get into the marketplace. If they come to us in that stage where they're already ready to go to market, the innovation patents are useful because that allows the inventor to put the word patented on the invention and enter the market so he can test out if it's going to work or not, if it's going to actually function in its market. So what that does is you could imagine a new invention coming onto the market and it's got the word patented on the box or something like that. That keeps the competitors away whilst he does the studies and whether or not his particular invention is going to work in the marketplace and customers are going to accept it. So it's quite useful in that regard. The other thing that most people want to know from us, and it's always an interesting one because people say, oh yeah, you, we know what you do, blah, blah, blah. Show us the evidence of runs on the board. And I would usually say, well, there's one that runs around all over Australia and you see it pretty well every day, but you don't know about it. And that's the hat brim that goes on a hard hat. And that snap brim is an invention that was invented some 15 years ago. I'll just give the, the listener a bit of a visual on that one. Yeah. So basically when you have a hard hat, yeah. um, they have a fairly small brim. They yeah. don't really protect you from the sun. And obviously in Europe where they develop, you know, they, there's not a lot of sun, so it's not a big issue. But here in Australia, you need a hard hat, but you also need some sun protection. So the inventor developed a donut shaped, flat donut shaped rim that goes around the hard hat, snaps under the hard hat and protects you from the sun as a dries away wood. Yeah, and so interestingly, that one you see everywhere. Uh, they're usually orange in color. They've got a flap down the back to stop the sun getting on the back of your neck and every, I can't think of anywhere where they work on the roads or elsewhere where they're not wearing the snap brim. That made about $4 million for the inventor who lives in Cairns. And uh, he sold it eventually to a new guy who does the distribution for him now in Perth. And Ian uh, in Perth does the actual distribution of the uh, snap brim now all over the world. And oh. yeah, it's gone to Europe as well as, and all you had to do was adjust the size and shape of the brim to suit different types of helmet. Uh, in the States and in Europe. And uh, also what he's done now is he's put a light on the brim. Now you think, why would you put a light on a brim? Well, for people who work at night on the railways, it's very important to see, see somebody from a distance uh, yeah. when you're driving a train. So cool. that's the sort of thing that becomes useful. So inventions lead to other inventions. Yeah. The other one that people will see every day and not really notice what it's about is probably the red tip banana that is in Woolworths on Coles and you wonder why there's a red tip on it. Well, to a certain extent, I've been <coughs> um, gazumped by the Landline programme recently on ABC uh, where they did a really good article about what's behind the red tip. Why is a red tip on this banana? One of the things that that has done for us is to show us that no matter how humble a particular thing might be just for growing a banana, this particular one will have a dramatic effect across the world of growing things without chemicals, without herbicides, without miticides, without any added commercial product onto the farm. And the reason he does that is because he does not want to kill the insects or the animals in the soil so nothing that he puts on his farm will kill any animals or insects and he uses the insects as a monitoring program, an official regulated monitoring program to make sure that the soil is 100% perfect to grow perfect fruit. So if you're out there and you like bananas, pick up a red tip and judge it for yourself. It's so much better than the ordinary bananas. No, I agree, it's a, it's a fantastic beneficial, ecologically sustainable way of doing things. And uh, I've forgotten his name now. Frank Shackle. Frank Shackle. He, he has, he's, a, 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 he's well ahead of his time. He's really just stepped outside the box, looked into the face of adversity, yeah. looked, been shunned by his peers, still understood the need for it and followed through. It's a, it's a massive show of persistence and a, and a, and a, and a fantastically successful product and you should That's be proud right. of it. Good to be involved in it. Uh, I wasn't involved in it, but you, it would be good to have been involved in it. Okay, um, well, I, you know, I know for a fact that, and I, I've seen how you work over the years, 
um, you're outcome driven, you want these people to succeed who come into your uh, into the into the folds of the invention pathways network and the trusted advisory service network. Um, and I think you know from what I've seen, the guidance, the advice, and the handholding you provide mm. is absolutely amazing. I, I've watched it, and I, I know there's, there's there's so much time when you're not being paid for your time, <laughs> and you're still plugging away trying to see an outcome. Um, and I'm sure that you know people who've been successful through through your guidance are, are most appreciative of that. And I and I certainly um, can see it for sure. Okay, so let's um, let's not drag it on too long. I don't want to, to bore people, but um, I'd like to just finish off. It's a little bit similar to the first question, but recipes for disaster. Just to say, just so people don't make these mistakes. Okay. Um, I guess one of the things that we watch for carefully with inventors that come through the door, over enthusiasm for their invention without thinking about it. Uh, the effect that it might have on their lifestyle if they do start to manufacture and go down the patenting process, the effect it would have on their family and so on. And believe it or not, we've seen with some inventions, some divorces and family breakups because people have spent too much money on their invention. These are social matters and um, they, they do affect us because sometimes we've seen really, really good inventions fall by the wayside uh, because of, if you like, family issues. And I can remember one and I'll give you an example and it's quite a good one really in many ways. A farmer came to me some years ago and he had a wallet sized thing that folded out into a flotation device. And he folded it out and he called it the V saver because it looked like a V. It was like having a pair of trousers upside down tied at the trouser end. And it was an invention that played on the system that most women have seen where you put a shirt in the washing machine and it bubbles up and you can't poke the air out of it and it's always gonna, you know what I mean? So what he did with that was he discovered that if he had a particular shaped trouser shaped item and he fell overboard out of a boat and he was in surf, the bubbles in the surf filled the legs up and it became something that you could float on. Mm. And that in effect is really a good safety device because the most people die in, when they fall overboard from a boat or they're in a sea through tiredness. They get too tired to swim and to keep their head above water Whereas this one, you just wrapped it around yourself and it would keep you afloat and alive. So that was called the V-saver. Where we had problems with it, with the inventor was, he could not find the exact material to use for the manufacture of it. And he started to traipse around Australia and overseas looking for the right material to use. The prototypes that he used worked, but of course the material eventually collapsed and so forth. So we did a film for him about it and so forth and we did a lot of work for him. We got the patent for him. And then one day he walked into my office and he said, I'm afraid I've got to give up all my efforts on my V-saver. And I said, why is that? Because it's a good invention. And he said, my missus has said, I've got to go back and grow bananas because that's what I do best and stop wasting money. Yep. And so I didn't have an answer for that. And so it worked. Ah, and Glenn just walked in. Stop, this is top. How are you? We're just it's doing a podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all right. No, no, it's okay. That's all right. It's okay. Do you want to join in? Do you want to join in? Yeah, first I just want 60 seconds. Yeah, sure. Yeah. We, can, we can put some help for one second and we'll come back to it. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, we just had Angela walk in, who's now the new owner of Invention Pathways, which was uh, coincidental and uh, fortuitous. We were just finishing off on the recipes for disaster. Terry was telling us uh, what he feels causes disasters and just finishing off the story about the the uh, v safe product yeah, the v -saver. it, it became, yeah. became a uh, a personal issue where he yeah he, uh, and the, he, he handed his keys he, in basically because his wife said yeah. this is very good invention so personal issues can get yeah. in the way. very good invention very good opportunity in the marketplace it would be urgently needed and something you could use and basically it was a a safety device that you could put in your bathers or in your pocket or in your handbag and you wouldn't want to be without it if you were on 
some sort of ferry up in the Asian area that turned over and so forth, you could just deploy it and save yourself. Yeah, so, so it's a really good idea. Great ideas can fall for many reasons, some That's personal. Right. And some this one fell typical. because the family needed some him back to grow bananas. Yeah. So yeah. that was that was the issue in there. In the end, we're all people and we all have people human needs. So we do. That has to be considered when you're doing these things. That's some right. people start the process not really knowing that they catch mm. a t- tiger by the tail and the end they end up working mm. very hard in a project and, mm. and realizing it wasn't what they wanted out of it so you've got to sort of forecast what might come from what you're doing and mm. initial planning where we sit down is what do you actually want out of the project do you want to have a job where you work very hard do you want to have a passive income through royalties how do you want to manage this and it's all part of the planning um, for me recipes for disaster um, people trying to make the product for their own needs you really got to make it for the market's needs, not your own own needs. Uh, if your needs fit the market, fair enough, but really it's a market you should be considering, mm. not your own. And the other thing I see people doing is trying to kill all the birds with one stone, trying to make a product that does everything for everyone. And what you do there is you work against the 80% of people who, like you, you, you put more cost into the product for 80% of people who want to use it for general use and you make it for the last five percent of people who want to use it for everything and you end up making the thing too expensive and you miss the market you, mm-hmm. you end up making it for five percent of the market and you make it unsuccessful on the flip side of that um one more question before i introduce uh, angelo the recipe for success what what would you give for a recipe for success a successful, successful well project? i suppose we can narrow it down to um um enthusiasm for your product but not too much enthusiasm not over enthusiasm for the product you've got to believe in what it is that you're doing it has to solve problems it has to have some benefit in the hands of an eventual user and it has to be something a recipe for success might be simplicity of manufacture and something that the public will accept readily and straight away safety is interesting as an angle um, some safety items will get into the market easily, some won't. An example of that is the, and I'm in a time when I can remember when it was, when they introduced the safety belts in cars. Nobody would put them in themselves, into the cars. It had to be regulated because nobody wanted to know that they would have an accident in their car. That's something they, did, they couldn't re- resolve in their minds. So it had to be a bit of legislation to make people put on their safety belt. So some safety items are in that category. They won't enter the market because people believe that they're never going to be in that position to need that item. So that's one of the things that we have to look at twice, which is things that are supposedly safer. Yeah. 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 So that's, that'll give you one example. Yeah. For me, I, I think simplicity, you hit on that. I think it's yeah. very, very important to have a simple, the simplest way to do the product in, a, in, in the way the market wants to use it and suits all the functional needs will give you a really good product. Products I see going really badly are overly complicated. There's, t- there's a few reasons why you wouldn't want to overcomplicate something. The tooling costs are higher, the logistics are, are more difficult, you've got to assemble more parts, you've got to stock more parts, you've got to, um, you know, uh, you've got so many so many issues with that people can come under you mm. by making a simpler product than yours and and go on the market for a cheaper product it can undermine a whole project so it's harder to make a simple product than it is to make a complicated product because you can throw technology at something uh-huh. and solve it fairly easily mm. the I'll put, I'll put projects in front of people and go oh why don't i think of that it's because well i put six months into thinking and making it simple but it has to be simple very important so Thank you, Terry. I'll, I'll, um, I'll just introduce Angelo now. Angelo's come back from his meeting, so we've, we've uh, got the pleasure of speaking to him. Angelo's just bought, he, he runs a company called the Trusted Advisory Service here in Townsville, and it's, it's mainly accounting based, but um, he was right alongside Terry at, at Herlock's and Invention Pathways. And, um, and, and Angelo's seen you know, how passionate Terry has been and how successfully he runs the company, and, and Angelo's decided to buy into um, invention pathways and Terry's basically educating um, Angelo and Ian on the process um, but I've only just met Angelo he seems like a really energetic and enthusiastic sort of person which is exactly the sort of person you need in this industry and uh, and I guess uh, the most impressive thing that I've seen in the last few days of us speaking is your 
um, planning towards filling a gap which is generally very hard to fill in this industry where um, you're going to try and provide funding options for inventors and that's that's one thing that I've always always struggled with it's sort of so easy to make money in property in Australia that most people would take that path other than invention because they don't really understand it I'm the same I don't invest in property too much I, I do a little bit but um, I know invention so I, I put my money into invention and I guess what what uh, te- uh, what uh, Angela is going to try and do is educate uh, investors in a way that allows them to sort of and and safeguard their money in a way that sort of allows them to get into these very lucrative projects um, if they're managed correctly um, and I'd just like to sort of get a few words from you if you don't mind Angela and just sort of talk about your plans for the future of invention pathways and and what sort of strategies you've got for the funding options well this started because I chair a local education bursary after my mentor and what we do is we help anybody under 27 without any income or assets test to receive a bursary for an entrepreneurial idea right so we've been going 12 years there's 32 recipients the two youngest were one of 12 two years ago and one of 14 last year wow the 12 year old has developed six apps four dot coms he was invited to the Global Economic Summit by the White House a genius. in Silicon Valley wow. in 2016. 2017, he got invited to the Indian GEC by the Prime Minister of India. And last year, he attended the European GEC. Um, Phenomenal. And what I've been amazed with is that this young boy has the challenge of some autism spectrum. Hmm. Now, in some cases, it's a challenge, but it also helps him with his products because he focuses. The other 14-year-old is a young boy who developed an app to help disabled people or people who are distant and remote from their mailbox to know when there's mail in their postbox without having to go and look. Great idea. And he spends his time volunteering on weekends to help the council address, the city council address challenges that they have uh, using electronics and that sort of stuff so i've seen an amazing array of entrepreneurs and i've known terry since 1987 and in that time the one thing i've heard from him is we've got to find a way to fund the next 10 or 20 thousand for an inventor to get from this stage to the next stage once we get to that stage we can see then how successful it may be And so that's where I'm looking to try and get a fund of international venture capitalists, venture angels, philanthropic organizations, local philanthropists and others to get a fund for pre-qualified applicants. Now they may not have a patent, they may be in the process of getting a patent or they may be some of the people we've worked with who already have a patent but they would come to us, we would recommend who should go before the panel and the panel will decide independently as to whether or not their case satisfies the funding requirements. I think it's a brilliant idea and I love the concept. Secondly, we have recently learned about equity crowdfunding. Sure. Equity crowdfunding works very well for an emotional issue or an issue which society engages emotionally with, such as the all-female taxi service, female taxi drivers, female passengers, and children under six. That raised its capital in an incredible short time. Mm. We've and also, the avenue for the raising of the capital is social media? Yes, or, or yes, a, and you do need social media campaign. Yeah. yeah. So we've seen... And and, and I think there's a third party involved, uh, which you spoke about today. So there are 13 uh, registered uh, intermediaries that the government has approved at a federal level. And those people take on opportunities for people who've got an idea that they want to raise funding for. And they can help raise funding in crowdfunding or in equity crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. For us at the moment, we have a couple of ideas and 
we saw the success of a local business up on the Atherton Tableland called Mangali Creek Dairy. They have a process of raising their cows and treating their milk in a way that is ecoganic. So they're accountable for their inputs as well as the outputs. And that uh, crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding, was taken up within its time and they exceeded their minimum. Mm. We have other, another client who could fit into that same mould and it's to do with preserving the reef mm -hmm. and improving the health of the soil in their paddocks for long-term viability of farming. But there's other opportunities. They were emotional ones. We're looking at an organisation talking about using a sterilisation unit for the public. I won't say the application other than that it's a health issue. We're also looking at another application by a different group of inventors who are looking to work at saving energy costs. So these are the sorts of opportunities that we're, in we're talking to these uh, intermediaries about to help our clients raise the money to do what they wanted to do. Yeah, sure. That sounds fantastic. As, as I said, we talk about successes and failures. One of the primary reasons for failure um, was financial and planning of finances, cash flow. So I, I really see this as a major, major turn point for this industry. And I wish you all the best of luck. We, we're sort of running out of time. We, we're sort of hitting into the 40, 40 minute sort of mark here. So we, we've got to pull it up. But I might actually have a, a separate discussion with you about the Trusted Advisor, advisor Centre. Um, but I'd seriously advise people who've got a social, socially beneficial um, product or idea to maybe give uh, Angelo a buzz at the Trusted Advisory Centre up here in Townsville. Um, and, you know, between him and the Invention Pathways um, companies, I'm sure that they can uh, take your project in and get your commercial outcome on the other end. You've been listening to Off to Market with Scott Farley and Hamish Chadwick.